I'll tell you just briefly about this stuff we've been doing in the last month with the Keystone Pipeline, because it's not because it's so unbelievably important. It's important, but you know, stopping it does not stop global warming. Okay, it's one thing among many things. Okay, but it was interesting and emblematic. We should have got. I should have got involved in it years ago. I've known for years that there was this nasty project going on up in Alberta because I've heard from lots of indigenous friends of mine about, I mean, it's, it's disgusting. If you have Google Earth, you can look at it quite easily. It's probably the biggest single physical feature, man-made feature on the planet now. They've only got 3% of the oil out of those tar sands. But they've already moved more Earth than they moved to build the Great Wall of China and the Suez Canal and the 10 biggest dams on Earth. Okay? It's insane. So if you were an aboriginal person who happened to live there, your life is literally turned upside down. So I should have been involved, but you know what? There's a thousand things sort of like that going on around the world at any given moment. And how on earth do you ever kind of figure out what thing to be? I don't know. I don't have to do that. But in the spring, Jim Hansen said, published a paper from NASA, said, you know what? Those tar sands are the second biggest pool of carbon on the planet. If we could burn them all tonight, which we can't actually, but if you could somehow torch them all right now, you would raise the atmospheric concentration of CO2 from 390 parts per million to 540 parts per million. Just from that one pool of carbon. He said, look, if we tap into this heavily, then it will be essentially game over for the climate. And since there was this proposal to build the first really big pipeline up into it, this Keystone XL, for I guess for extra water, <laughs> um, um, we decided that we had to try and stand up against it, even though the odds seemed not very good, because no one had heard of it. And we thought, well, how do we make people hear of it? We don't have the money to go buy and how we can't spend, you know. We've been spending our passion and spirit and creativity, and that's gotten us pretty good ways, but not far enough. We better spend our bodies, too. And so we put out, wrote a letter, and Wendell Berry signed it, and Naomi Klein signed it, and a couple of those indigenous leaders signed it. We sent it out as far and wide as we could on the internet, saying, come to Washington, prepared to get arrested. City enough. We didn't know how many people, we had no idea, we had anyone. We got there the first day of what was going to be two weeks of steady day-by-day -day arrests, and on that first morning, 80 people showed up to get arrested, which was a lot more than we'd expected, and it was also a lot more than the park police had expected. We were used to dealing with you know, three or four people kind of getting around, they had to you know, take you off, find you, release you, whatever. They didn't like this. And they, oh, we're going to, the guy said, we're going to deter you guys. We do not want to deal with this for two weeks. Um, so they took us off to jail, and we spent, I was in central cell block in D.C. for three days, which is just as fun a location as it sounds like it would be. <laughs> and, uh, and happily, it didn't deter them when it had the opposite effect, as often happens in these kind of situations. And before the two weeks was over, 1,253 brave people had come and gotten arrested. Brave because it's hard to do. We're all used to doing what police tell us to do. And it's psychologically difficult when they say move to stay where you are. Um, um, doesn't feel right. It shouldn't probably feel right. You know? um, we all got handcuffed, and we all got put in a paddy wagon and taken away, and, and, and it was good. By the end of it, we actually had drawn some attention to this thing. And then we followed up, and there were young people, especially all fall on, wherever the president went, since he was the one who was going to have to grant or deny this permit, wherever he went, there were young people. He showed on campus, maybe 300 respectful and nice young people, and they'd be chanting, Yes, we can stop the pipeline. <laughs> and in early November, we called everybody back to D.C. and said, You know, we don't need to get arrested this time. We've done that. We're going to come. We're going to do this too. So we can circle the White House with people. And we didn't actually know if we could, right? No one had done it. We, I wouldn't even know how many people we tried to count on Google or you know, <laughs> We just took a lot. As it turned out, we had plenty. We were five.
dive deep shoulder to shoulder around the White House. It was gorgeous, just amazing. And everybody there, every sign was just a quote from Barack Obama from 2018. You know, time to end the tyranny of oil. In my administration, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and the planet will begin to heal. Good, strong words. And, and we said we trust that you meant them. And um, four days later, he decided to delay for a year this room to allow more time for review, which was a good thing, more than we had hoped for. <laughs> but here's in a sense where the story gets interesting. That should have been the end of it for a year. We should have done, done this environmental review, and that would make sense. You know, look carefully at things, figure out the way that they have the scientists in, do the work the government. And instead, the Congress decided that they would intervene. And they did not hold extensive hearings to figure out what was going on. They did not invite in climate scientists to learn about you know, the danger. No, they basically just listened to the fossil fuel industry and without debate and without work, they thought they had the president on the horns of the dilemma. They passed legislation attached to the payroll tax cut, which they had to get saying, you must give a decision on this pipeline within 60 days. And they said to him, in very blatant language, you do this or you're going to pay a price. The head of the American Petroleum Institute, a.k.a. Mr. Big Oral, stood up and gave a speech and said, if you do not grant this permit, there will be huge political consequences, quote, unquote. A threat that they have the money to make good on. And so it was good last week when the president said, if you force me to make a decision, the decision is no. Okay? We're denying the permit. And that was good. It was really good. It was not just the right thing to do, it was a brave thing to do. And for those of us, me included, who have criticized the president of some terms for not being bold and forthright enough and for trying too hard to be friendly and you know, nice at every turn and so on and so forth. It wasn't like that. He stood up. God only knows if this is how the story ends. They're busy in Congress trying to figure out nine other ways to push this thing through. But for the moment, you know, we have we've won the only kind of victories environmentalists ever win, which are temporary ones. But we've won the victory one for a while. And it's a great testimony to all the brave people and all the um, good-hearted and hard-working people who made it happen. Um, and as I said before, it barely scratches the surface of what we need to do about climate change. For me, and I think for many of us, in a sense, the most important part of it was almost educational. It was learning kind of how this world works. Learning that when we got to Congress, it was going to be terrible and unfair. Um, when Congress took a vote on this, okay, 234 to 193, the U.S. House voted to speed up the approval of this pipeline. And those 234 members had taken $42 million from the fossil fuel industry. Now, we're used to thinking that that's just how it's going to be. That that's realism and how it's going to work and there's no use. If that's how it's going to work, we're going to lose this fight and we're going to lose this planet. All right? So we've got to figure out how to change it. We have got to go, we've got to stop playing defense, trying to stop this thing one pipeline and one coal mine at a time. And we've got to play offense for a while and figure out how to match the power of those guys. And it will only happen if we're willing to be involved. And so we're trying to figure out how. One of the things that's most obvious and blatant is that our Congress, each year, 
votes to give, and this is almost sort of rubbing salt in the wound, he votes to give massive subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Billions upon billions of dollars. Why? Not because they need it, they're the most profitable industry on earth. Not because it makes sense to subsidize. What are we subsidizing? We've known how to burn coal and gas and oil for 250 years. There's no trick here that we're helping them figure out, okay? We just do it because they give little presents to legislators who then give them big presents with our money. And it should stop. It's not fair. People should not take money from companies and then vote on their interests. If it happened in any other sphere of our life, if Exeter and Andover got together for the football game, you know, in the fall, and someone noticed that the dastardly you know, the headmaster of Andover was giving wads of cash to the referees before the game, <laughs> there would be an outrage. People would be out of their mind. You know, if someone discovers before the Super Bowl that Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, is buying off, there would be a national scandal, uh, you know, on a level we've hardly ever seen. But Since we Penn State. That in Congress, this is the way it will be. And we can't accept it anymore. We have to be kind of aggressively naive and say, this is not right, we can't do it. So, here's the campaign we need your help with. And we launched it on Tuesday. And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disrobe here for a moment to show you what we're doing. On, uh, on, on Tuesday, Tuesday we went up to <laughs> <laughs>